Hello and welcome to this interview with director of new documentary, Birth Gap, and the most cancelled man in Cambridge, Stephen J. Shaw. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. So if for our audience who aren't familiar with this, who haven't seen your previous interviews or the first part of the documentary um, with the other parts pending release, hopefully, um, do you mind describing your career history and your motivation for, for making this documentary? Uh, historically, um, I, I'm a data scientist. That's what we call people who are into both statistics and computer coding. It's what I've done for most of my career. Um, seven years ago, I was working on a project doing forecasting actually in the automotive industry. Uh, my company is based in the US, although I'm originally from the UK. And we do a lot of forecasting. Um, I started to look at population trends around the world, and I was just shocked at what I was seeing. I mean, to the point I didn't actually believe the data initially. Um, the idea that, for example, in Italy right now, we have around 900,000 people aged 50, but only 400,000 newborns. I mean, less than half. Um, the idea that this data is not commonly, this, you know, people just aren't aware of the scale of birth rate decline around the world. And seven years ago, I got so concerned for my own children's future, uh, for the future of society. I also felt that because I'm involved with data, you know, I do this for a living, I do forecasting. If I didn't know this, my guess was a lot of other people don't either. And even more than that, it was very obvious the clients that we deal with who are pretty senior executives often. We're not talking about this. So if corporations aren't talking about it, and I'm not hearing about it from the world of politics or in the media, other than maybe once a year, uh, it's changing a little bit now. I, I, I know this in the UK, even in the past week or so, it mm -hmm. seems to have changed. Um, and Japan, it's certainly um, is something that is talked about, but mostly going back to 2016, no one was really talking about birth rate decline. And I just decided I had to, well, my first idea was to write a book about it. I felt I was just about able to, you know, do some research, perhaps travel to Japan and travel to some countries in Europe and figure out a little bit more as to why this trend was happening in some countries more than others. Um, my, my younger son said that uh, no one reads books anymore. Younger people don't read books anymore. You have to make a documentary. And at that point, I was like, well, that's not me. You know, there's just no way. I've never in a million years ever considered myself as filmmaking. Uh, you, no. But as luck would have it, a friend of a friend mentioned there was someone out of DC who uh, had been an anchor and roving reporter for a network news channel who was now independent, uh, Elise uh, Miller Cosgrove. And Elise and I decided, okay, well, let, let's see if we can at least film some interviews of as I travel around the world so that we have them on record. My thought was, well, that will save me taking notes while I'm talking to people about, whether it's experts or talking to people about their lives. But once we got going and people started opening up about their lives, it was just obvious that I had to make this into a documentary somehow. And four years later, uh, COVID hit. The week before lockdown started, we finished filming. So it was incredibly fortuitous because we then had this time for editing. And one thing you could do in COVID lockdown time was was edit. And uh, that only took two years. Um, so this project, all, all in all, has taken about seven years of my life. And uh, I was delighted to release the, the film. It was uh, entered and successful in New York uh, Chelsea Film Festival. We got two versions released there, in fact. And now I'm looking forward to the next part of the, this journey uh, for me, which is trying to work with anyone who will listen, whether it be governments or corporations or, or people, communities, about how we solve this problem. Yeah, it's also, it's, it's funny when you said it's fortuitous that you finished right before lockdowns here. It also precipitated something that, that wasn't predicted under lockdown, but that you probably would have seen coming considering you studied the economic circumstances in Japan, Italy, and uh, Germany and how they preceded demographic decline. And that is that when lockdown happened, we got articles over here and in the BBC saying, we're going to have a lockdown baby boom. Because obviously, when people are at home, 
they don't have much else to do. Therefore, they thought there's going to be a massive jump in conceptions. And about a year or so later, they were interviewing couples. And I remember an interview the BBC did with an Italian couple specifically. It might have been CapEx. I'll get the article. And one of them said, we don't believe that the economic circumstances are going to be right for us right now because of lockdown specifically to have had children. So people were at home and, and the whole time not producing any more babies, even though they had no excuse not to. Um, what, what was the situation in Italy that first pricked your ears up to this then? Well, going back to the 1973 period, mm -hmm. the original, yes. Uh, and by the way, you're right, for, for lockdown, uh, COVID, I was already predicting based on what I, I know happens during times of uncertainty that mm -hmm. there would be a decline in births. And that's what, what we know did happen mostly. Um, I, I, what I was trying to do was find out what happened in Japan, Italy, and Germany around 1973, 74, Germany a little bit earlier. Um, because we saw very sharp falls in birth rates um, at the same time on both continents. Um, and this also includes other countries like Spain, Italy, Austria, Portugal, but I had really rich data on Italy and Japan in particular. And you know, I, I, I took the longest time before I really jumped to conclusions, but it was obvious that something had happened around the summer of 1974, July 74, and for, for Japan, where there's remarkably detailed data, if you look at all of the individual prefectures of Japan, we saw this common trend, whether it was like an urban area like Tokyo or Osaka, or a very rural area, like, you know, well, there's so many Aoyama to take one. So I decided to do a test as to statistically how likely it would be for every prefecture in Japan to suddenly have a shift downwards in one month. And it was like one in a million that that would ever happen all at the same time. And I sent a young researcher to uh, the, the National Library in, in Tokyo, a Japanese uh, young woman who spent days looking at what would have happened in July 74. And we couldn't find anything until I realized I was being incredibly silly. I then said, try to look nine months before July 1974, when conceptions might have been happening. And she called within minutes and said, it's the oil shock. Um, I think it was October 9th or 10th, if I remember, 1973, the oil shock hit. And all over the front page newspapers in Japan, there was stories of shortages of the basics uh, worries about inflation, increasing costs, and why? Well, Japan has very few uh, natural resources in terms of energy. It was the world's largest importer at that time. So you had a country which was booming economically, uh, booming in terms of babies too, suddenly put in this position where there's uncertainty. Mm. Now, if you look at Italy as well, academics say Italy was also one of the worst hit by the oil shock. And we saw the same thing happening there, the same uncertainty. So what we then did was look at other crises around the world. We looked in South Korea at the, the currency crisis of the mid 90s, uh, and particularly the 0708 mortgage Lehman crisis. Mm. And we saw every time there's a crisis like this, we see a huge shift in birth rates, uh, but not all birth rates. I, 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 if you're willing to continue, I'll just to explain what we actually discovered. Please do. Um, in all of these places, if you already had a child during a crisis, it didn't affect the likelihood if you had one that you're going to go on to have two, three, four, five. In fact, if you have one, there's actually an increase, acceleration of having two slightly. But if you had no children, uh, the number of people starting families for the first time fell drastically. So if you take Japan, for example, Italy is almost identical, but uh, childlessness in Japan in 73 was around three, 4%. Within three years, it was up to 22%. And very quickly beyond that, it went up to over 30%, where it remains today. So you have this overnight shift in demographics. And demographics usually change very, very slowly mm. you know, over generations. So for something to happen inside three, four years, in Japan, in Italy, in Germany, in Spain, Austria, et cetera. And then if we move to 07, 08, you know, childlessness in the US was around 15%, um, which is not unusual for more developed nations now, but it went to 35%, you know, again, in a very short period from 08 to 2012. So we're seeing these remarkable fast shifts 
And what that relates to um, is a delaying of parenthood. It's not people deciding, oh, we don't want kids. These are people who were planning to have kids. We know that because you don't get shifts so quickly on mass people deciding not to have children. So these were people who were pulled into what I call unplanned childlessness, simply waiting in the expectation they'll have a child in a few years. And then that opens up a whole other part of the story. Why is it then that people, why is it that people then often do not have children when they intended to? And why is it that after these crises, the societal childlessness never goes down, you know, once triggered? Mm. Uh, and those are big questions. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, it's still something that uh, merits further research, but the trend is very, very clear that unplanned childlessness is causing low birth rates. I remember in your conversation with friend of the show, Chris Williamson, you cited a particular data set that said, of the women that suffered from unplanned childlessness by the time they were about 40 years old, there was about 10% who had said they never wanted children. That could be the category which the media are definitely trying to scaremonger young women into by saying the climate crisis. If you have too many babies, you're going to increase CO2, therefore it's irresponsible to bring a child into the world. That number hasn't really shifted from that 10%. There was another 10% who tragically had fertility problems. Um, I suppose we can talk about that later with the WHO findings recently, which is quite worrying. But then the rest of the 80%, they succumbed to unplanned childlessness of where they'd always intended to have a child, but they cited economic conditions or not finding the right man at the right time or just never getting round to it. And so it is quite disturbing to know that people's best intentions are being waylaid at, through poor planning or through unforeseen circumstances and that they're ending on on mass up very very lonely it, it, i think you're right to be concerned about this epi epidemic i mean i i can only speak to personal experience i'm 24 and looking at the post lockdown inflation in the uk looking at the high rates of mass immigration which is a, probably about the only time before this week, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, where you heard about birth rates. It was always the justification for the need for immigration. Um, looking at the knock-on effect of that for housing prices from since 1997, house prices have gone from three times the average income to 12 times. I, one of the main things I want to do in my life is, is be a dad. And your documentary has actually accelerated my timeline. But it, it you do get a crushing weight of, okay, how am I going to afford a wedding? How am I going to afford a house deposit? Inflation's eating away at my savings. It, it puts you on a clock and it it is pretty harrowing. So I'm, I'm not surprised that lots of people are, are feeling this way. Uh, the, the immigration angle is actually an interesting one to go down because in, in your visits, you didn't just go to Western countries. You went to a, a lot of undeveloped countries where most people would think that the birth rates are a lot higher. And that's why we can import lots of people from those countries to, to make up the, the shortfall of the labor force. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Because that was very surprising. Yes. So the whole immigration question, of course, it's up to any individual nation to decide what the right immigration levels are. What I would say from a really purely almost mathematical point of view is that immigration can never be the solution to the birth rate crisis. Um, um, so maybe I could cover that first because mm. I think it's important. And by the way, I, I consider myself, I am an immigrant. I actually live in Japan now. Mm. I've lived in the US before. Uh, family members, if you knew my history, uh, immigration is something that you know I think is important in, uh, in certain numbers. But the idea that you can replace the babies that you're not having with immigrants, well, maybe you can, but um, what, what happens, and I think it's universal is either in the first generation or by the second generation, immigrant families are having the same number of children on average as the original domestic uh, population. So you get a situation where very quickly the uh, birth rates are you know back to where they were. In fact, they rarely go up at all. Then those immigrants, of course, get older and need supported. So what you then need is more immigrants and then more immigrants mm. and more immigrants. And mathematically, that will never end. You know, it's not as if immigrants are balancing the birth rate mm. at all. Now, um, can immigration play a role in balancing this? Yes, sure, but it's not the solution. You need a solution first, and then you need to perhaps look at immigration as a way to you know, balance things a little bit quicker than they might otherwise have. No, no, that's just coldly from a mathematical point of view. What I found um, did surprise me, you're right, I went to Nepal. Um, now, Nepal's 
overall birth rate, the average number of children per, per woman, is now at or below replacement level. So it's down to two. Mm. It was, I believe, seven you know, 20 years ago, and an incredibly rapid transformation has happened there. And I met with the, the head of the Department of Demographics of the largest university um, in Nepal, Kathmandu. And uh, I wanted to talk about the birth rate trends and how Nepal might be looking to, he was a government advisor, to kind of lessen the, the descent of birth rates. And all he wanted to talk about, almost all, was migration hmm. and how painful it is for Nepal that all the young people are leaving. Yeah. You know, here's a poorer country that's developing quite quickly, uh, that should be benefiting from the demographic boom of having a, a young, pretty educated, younger population, but the people who are most population are, are leaving. Mm. And then there's another side to it as well. Very often, it's actually the men that are leaving. And in the case of Nepal, the example was given, that often they go to Dubai, for example, and the young men either are not married, which means there's another young woman in Nepal that he, would, he, he might match with who's waiting and not having a family, or they are married, but the young man is getting three weeks leave per year to come back and try and think of creating a family in yeah. three weeks, once a year. So you have this rocketing childlessness in Nepal. And we went up with the Himalayas, uh, well, three hours by drive, so of course nowhere near the top, but still up into a very rural region. And we just saw these old people sitting on their own, just doing nothing, just looking forlorn. And um, the conversation in those villages were that, um, yeah, their, their children had gone either to the cities or overseas. And yes, they were getting remittances, they were getting some money back, but these older people, often women, mm. given women live longer, were... It's not money they needed, you know, it, it, it's it's family, it's community. So the heart of the community of these small villages is being torn away. And i can give you another example I haven't talked of before. We, we also went to the Andes and um, went up high in the Andes to a small community on harvest day and filmed these farmers who were celebrating because they'd had a bumper harvest you know, that, that, uh, that, that day. And I interviewed two sets of farmers and they both happened to have four sons. So eight you know, young farmers between the two, uh, the, the two older couple. And I said to them, well, where are your sons? You're just, just you, you're all in your 60s. Where are the young men helping you with the harvest? And like, oh, well, they're in the cities or they're overseas. Like all, all eight of them. Mm. And I asked one, Farmer, how long he and his family had lived in the Andes? It was 15 generations. And I asked, well, who's going to continue? And he said, oh, they have to come back. They have to come back. Or my grandchildren, they have to come back. But he was trying to convince himself yeah. that they would come back. So, you, you, you know, there, there, there's another side to immigration that I wasn't aware of, which is the problem that's left behind. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, you're interested in this. I'll tell you another story. I was um, in Germany, and I went. I wanted to find uh, recent immigrants from Syria um, or Lebanon. I think where I, I found a young couple, and they were pretty educated, but they were in Germany. And I asked them, "Were they planning a family?" And he said, yes, of course, but not here. We want to go home. You know, we, we don't want to start a family here. There's too mm -hmm. much uncertainty. They weren't able to work because they had to learn the language first. So they were taking German lessons. But they were saying, but we, but we want to go home. We're, we're, this is not our future here. So I think we get a perception that, you know, welcoming people. Well, it's a good thing to welcome people, of course, but... It, we shouldn't always make the assumption that everybody who wants to, you know, immigrate is necessarily here for the long term or nece necessarily doesn't want to go back home eventually. It just seems very imbalanced the way we talk about immigration, frankly. I, I think we don't see the other side of the story, you know, in the countries that they leave. We don't understand that some of these people actually really are pining to go home, that that's their mm -hmm. ultimate goal. And, um, you know, so I, I learned a lot about immigration that, uh, that, that it's not just a simple case of it's a magic solution to birth rates. Yeah, well, we, we see cultural deterioration and alienation in cities resulting from mass immigration over here. But you're right, one of the, one of the saddest things, particularly with that example of the farm in the Andes, is that 
The current paradigm of materialism, you know, constantly importing people to make up for low birth rates and expediently having the incentive to do so because an adult registers on a GDP sheet, whereas a child doesn't for 18 years, that that affects us majorly. But there are intangibles that are lost in the gaps, not just the development of developing countries, but if they've got a more agrarian relational economy, well, then you've decimated that inside a year by having nothing to hand these lands these professions off to down the generation. So you're destroying their culture just as much as ours, just so you can register it on a bar graph rather than having some long-term thinking. And that's pretty tragic. One of the most alarming things that, that you did was go to India, Bangladesh, sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. where most people think, okay, because the UK is drawing lots of immigrants from Asia and Africa at the moment, that they're going to be endlessly abundant supplies of human capital because mm. their birth rate is much higher. Mm. And the really alarming thing you found was actually that India and Bangladesh are on the same demographic trend yes. of sub-replacement birth rates. Yes. So uh, India, I think, is a great example um, right now because it has effectively just now become the most populous nation on earth, having mm. overtaken China. And this population will continue to increase up to around 1.7 or 1.8 billion people, but then it will stop and it will fall. The great thing about demographics is you can actually see pretty far into the future, two, three, four decades. Um, you know, For example, if you want to know how many 80-year-olds there might be in the year 2100, you just need to look at how many births there were globally in the year 2020. Those people mm. are already born. Of course, not all will make it to 80, but we have a pretty good idea. So looking a few decades in advance is something that we should be doing more often. And if you were to look at India, you would see that the actual net total births has been falling quite sharply over the past 10 years. Birth rates there are already down to replacement level, 2.0 or less per, per woman. And what was shocking to me is if you look at states in India, in the South and North East, they've got birth rates as low as much of Europe, you know, 1.5, 1.6 children per woman. You see the exact same effect happening inside India mm -hmm as is happening in the rest of the world. So for me, I'm really worried about India 50 years from now. If 50 years from now, India is gonna become the next Italy or Japan with a burgeoning number of older people to support and a shrinking number of younger people. It's the same trend. Mm -hmm. uh, Bangladesh is also incredible. Um, you know, It did go from seven children down to two in only two, two and a half decades and it's continuing to fall. So we see all of these nations, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, same trend generally, but at a slower pace. Mm. Um, I, like, I like to compare this to a roller coaster where countries who are over the, the top of the, you know, the, the tracks, right in the front car, you've got Japan, Italy, Germany's pretty much there, uh, you know, Spain, Italy, South Korea, yeah, they're absolutely at the front. Then you've got the UK, US, uh, a little bit further back, but not that far back. Um, and in between those, Canada actually is really quite surprising, close to the front. Then you're going to have India and, you know, um, yeah, Bangladesh, Nepal, a bunch of countries that are, you know, we think of high birth rate, but actually Brazil as well, you know, quite, quite shockingly low. Then you have Sub-Saharan Africa in, in the rear car. But they're on the same trend. We can see the same patterns emerging there. So for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in recent decades, the average woman has been having one fewer child every 15 years. That, that's a big drop. But some countries like Malawi, um, Ethiopia, women are having one less child every 10 years, which is remarkably fast. Mm. So we can see Sub-Saharan Africa countries on the same trend, I'm estimating that by 2050, a number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa will be below replacement level as well. Some are slower. Uh, Nigeria is falling by one child every 25 years. Uh, and if you, uh, yeah, Nigeria, relatively speaking, in Africa is quite a wealthy country, mm. but it's quite a diversified country or stratified country. You have a lot of extreme poverty in parts, and that's the driver here. Large, larger families are linked to, to extreme poverty. If you need a child um, to go and fetch water because it's three miles away mm. and otherwise your family's going to, well, starve or um, go thirsty, you're not thinking about contraception. You're not thinking about you know global birth rate issues. You're thinking about survival. 
once you put uh, flowing water into a village, once you put a school, there's a complete flip of prioritizations for families. It's all focused on education as, as, as much as you can for probably two, maybe three children. So, um, you know, I, I have little doubt that there's still challenges of extreme poverty in, in parts of Nigeria. There clearly are, but the trend, if you just look at the data directionally, um, the world's getting wealthier, the world's getting healthier, and family size sizes are going down everywhere. So we've we've already covered how economic collapses or economic turmoil seem to precipitate birth rate declines. But obviously in those nations, they've continually been impoverished. And throughout human history, we've always faced adversity and privation and our ancestors were still capable of churning out kids. So so what other factors are compounding and, and causing this epidemic of unplanned childlessness? Well, so yes, back to maybe you know the original point first, you know, in terms of why it is that once we have these economic shocks, we find that people delay parenthood. Why then uh, do people end up you know, um, with unplanned childlessness? Well, it seems to be that there is an overestimation of our fertility windows, certainly for women, but also for men. Mm. Um, so I asked uh, people in a survey, at what point in time do you think, uh, this is to, to, to young Americans, uh, American, yeah, um, young American women, probably in the 20s and 30s, at what point did they think that they had a 50-50% likelihood of ever becoming a, mer a mother if they, if they had no children? And the most popular answer was 40. If, if you didn't have a child at 40, it would be 50-50 whether you ever became a mother or not. Mm. Uh, the real answer is 30, not 40. And this is, this is near global. Mm. Uh, there's one country that's an exception. Um, so on an almost global basis, if you have not had, as a woman, your first child by age 30, you've only a 50% chance of ever becoming a mother. The exception is Israel where it's 31, not 30. So it's it's almost the same. That, that When I heard that in the documentary, that is one of the most staggering statistics that, that hit me, especially because as we've covered recently, and as was Miriam Cates MP mentioned in her speech this week, citing unplanned childlessness by word as well. Um, she's also viewed our show before, so I suppose we can full. credit you for that. 52% um, of women in the UK have reached 30 with no children. Yes. So that's 52% of the population that now have a 50-50% chance of ever having children. Yes. So if you say 52% of no children, half of those will never have. That's best case. I, I think um, there's some banding of age data when it comes to births. So mm. I have to look at whether it's 30 or 29 or 28. I think in the UK, it's actually more closer to 28 than 30. Right. So um, yeah, we are looking at societal childlessness of around 32% in the UK right now, and that's increasing. So 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 why why is it that you know we're, we're it's only fifty percent chance likelihood? Fertility is not the biggest factor. It's it's related to it, but the biggest single factor is not having a partner at that right time. So you may prioritize, rightly so, your education, rightly so, your career, but always with the assumption that when you're ready, you'll have a partner to have a child with. And it so happens that very often that's not the case. And you're 32 and you've just had a breakup or you haven't found the right person yet, or you've got a divorce or your partner's not ready of a child. It's like, well, maybe next year uh, I need to do something more career-wise or let's travel a bit more. I've experienced that personally, so yeah. yeah. It, so it, it's, it's hard to align those things. And if you then, you know, bring back in the fertility question, um, you know, f for women, first of all, um, there, there's several factors. Um, the documentary uh, covers this. Uh, there's a we interviewed Kim Kardashian's fertility doctor, and he's these starbursts and little sweets. Um, you know, the candies are yellow and orange, and he describes good eggs and bad eggs. That a woman when she's 20, it may be that two out of five eggs are bad eggs, meaning they will not develop into a healthy baby. Um, and you know, that's a 20 year old. You took a 45 year old, it's more likely to be four out of five. Uh, very rough estimates, but you know, the quality of the eggs reduces over time. You know, people may not know this, but a, a woman is born with all her eggs. She does not create more eggs um, throughout her lifetime. And something else happens the quantity of eggs falls sharply as well. So, 
you have this double factor of reducing quality and reducing quality of eggs. And when does this happen? It varies. I mean, it can be quite, you know, some women, uh, you know, in, in their late 20s may already be on that curve. Others, of course, you hear of stories of occasionally people having children very later, but those are quite rare stories, though they do happen, thankfully. Um, but something else happens as well, the ability to carry a baby to term um, deteriorates as well. And there are some harrowing scenes in the documentary where, you know, we, we meet people who were unable to do that. You know, they went through IVF, which is also a highly complex procedure involving mm. lots of hormones. So I think we're, you know, we educate people on so many things about biology, I guess, about the, the, the planet, maybe not enough things, but this is one thing that should be paramount that you, 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 high school, college people should be fully aware of mm. fertility windows. Um, let me talk about men briefly here too, Please because do. they're often f forgotten. It, it's it is unfortunate we, we've got so much data on women because you know it's it's easy to measure. You know, any time a, a woman has a birth, you know, there's so much data recorded. Um, IVF treatments that's all recorded. Men, there's just less data around. So we often talk about women, but really we, we have to talk about women and men. In the case of men, men do also suffer fertility problems. But there's another factor that hadn't dawned on me, um, that as men get older, technically they may still be able to have a child, but they've got to find a younger woman to have a child with. Mm. And they're effectively competing with a younger version of themselves mm. to try and find you know, a woman in that window. So as you get older, unless you're particularly successful, wealthy, rich, famous, um, it gets harder and harder. And I've seen how men turning 40 suddenly can find it harder to get dates. You know, everything was going greatly at 30s, no rush, no rush. And I think, uh, you know, there, men also vastly overestimate their ability to, to kind of find someone. And there actually are more childless men and childless women. Mm. That's because some men uh, you know, marry twice and have children with uh, more than one woman. That happens more commonly than a woman having children with more than one man. So it's actually harder for men than women. So we, we have this fertility challenge. So let's come back to unplanned childlessness. I think a big part of it is people not fully understanding fertility probabilities. You know, that's what it comes down to. Fertility challenges might be a better way to say it. But let's go back to the oil shock, the mortgage crisis. What is it that's happening that make, you know, why is it that these crises can lock societies into these higher levels of childlessness? And I can only assume it's that people decide to spend a little bit longer developing their careers, traveling. In fact, that's what I heard from people all around the world, that that's the priority. And once that becomes a societal norm, once none of your friends are having children yet, it's 30, 32, mm -hmm. there's a sense of this is normal. Yeah. Um, no rush. In fact, in the work environment, maybe if your boss hasn't had children yet, or maybe your boss's boss, who might be 35, 36, why would I rush? You know, I, I want to show maybe that my career is, you know, that I'm as focused on my career. There's time. So for whatever reason, people wait and that becomes a societal norm. What I didn't realize until I spoke to people, men and women, as you see in the documentary, who became childless, not by choice, unplanned childlessness. The grief, and that's the term they use, the grief that they go through about not having had children. Their support groups, um, and anyone listening to this, I know there'll be people listening to this in this position. I'd thoroughly recommend you search out groups. Um, you know, there's, there's a, for women, there's a great group called uh, Gateway Women. There's others for men who, you know, they provide support, they provide, you know, empathy. Um, I'm often criticized, so I should say something. It is possible to get over the grief, but I also know that not everybody does. Mm. Um, you know, there are women who have been challenged in the past, who have become positive and are now working within their communities and giving back to their communities. And certainly I would say this too, that, you know, those people who choose not to have children, uh, I must say this, 
if you do not want to have children, I will be your biggest supporter. No one should feel forced or coerced into having children who doesn't want. That to me is not right. Just in the same way, people should not be coerced into not having children mm. or having fewer children. This is a personal choice. And um, so just, just to say that these personal choices, we, we often look at people without children. And I think we wrongly assume that most people without children didn't want children. And it's not true at all. And I think we need to be more aware of this, more empathetic to what some people in this position are, are going through and to welcome them into communities. So there's an author called Melanie Notkin, who's written a book called Otherhood, who started a group called Savvy Aunties about what women who plant of children and who didn't, what they can do for their communities, not only to their own nephews and nieces, but within communities. But, you know, it, it's not an ideal position for anybody. It's not an ideal position for the people involved. It's not an ideal uh, ideal society. F uh, it's not an ideal position for communities. And now as a planet, by and large, we're faced with a socioeconomic crisis from all this that I think few of us have, have been aware of, certainly me, until seven years ago. I think as well to, to talk about the incentive structures that are going against young women specifically because they have a narrower window but but also young men who've got their foot on, got to get their foot on the economic ladder to, to support a family most households require two incomes now the government specifically in the uk is trying to emulate the nordic model and increase uh, amounts of state funded childcare to try and get a boost and i know from Miriam Cates' speech, and also I believe you focused on this a little bit in the documentary, that this might provide a tiny temporary boost, but one, arguably, from the research I've seen, at the expense of a child's ability to, to form long-term attachments and, and sometimes even their lifelong success and intelligence level, but also it's not a long-term fix. Again, it doesn't. It might provide a temporary boost to some people who, who want to have kids and, and they feel it's more affordable to put them in a nursery and go back to work, but it doesn't necessarily, say, it doesn't necessarily increase the amount of of people having children or even those people having more children because it doesn't make it affordable. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on those policies by any chance. Well, I, have a, I do have thoughts on policies generally, and that is that they don't work. Mm. Um, you cannot point to any policy and say consistently, anytime you do X or Y, you're going to get a sustained long-term increase in birth rates. There's some isolated examples, at least for periods of time, but mostly it seems to be temporary uh, boosts. For example, uh, Sweden's often cited here as having uh, had a series of family-friendly policies which have been successful. But if you look at the data, you do get a boost in the short term, but then you get a decline, and the decline takes you down lower than where you were in the first place. So what most likely has happened is you've pulled forward, you've accelerated you know, the timing of when people were going to have children. Hmm. They were going to have children anyway, so why not take advantage of, of this policy? Um, and the policies that you look at that might be, be considered partially successful, they take you nowhere close to getting back to long-term stable uh, populations, which require an average 2.0 surviving children uh, per woman. Um, and unless you get to that point, you know, you're, you're on a long-term path or maybe short-term path to, yeah, the end of your civilization. I mean, that's what we're faced with right now. There are civilizations right now that are on the brink. I mean, I, I, it's a stark thing to say, but it's a reality. Yeah. Do you, do you think this is us being a victim of our own material prosperity in a sense? And is it that the incentive structures may not be necessarily rectified by policy, but there needs to be a sort of mindset change or a philosophical change or more information given to, to make that conscious choice earlier. Do you, do you think there's there's any way in which there can be material incentives to, to stabilize it? Or is it work like yours that needs to better inform people to make that choice? Uh, honestly, I, 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 the, the best news um, I took from the documentary and um, has been has given me optimism is that people mostly still want children. Mm. You know, it's around 95% of people want to have children at some point. And when I have screened the documentary, particularly to younger people, um, including the group at Cambridge University, we yes. had we had the uh, clandestine meeting after the event was cancelled. Uh, um, incredibly, some students didn't want other students to, to listen to this documentary. 
Um, but the stories from students at Cambridge, but it's global. Um, they're shock because I think young people assume, um, because there's nothing out there to the contrary at the moment, study hard, train hard, work hard, establish a career, but we don't then tell them how to do the next part. Mm. I think there's the assumption there, particularly uh, pretty much by definition, younger people have parents who were able to have children. So there's an assumption that, well, my parents mostly got it right. You know, they were able to have family, so it'll happen to me too. Hmm. Maybe there's always a little bit of doubt, but when you see the reality that only half of women age 30 without a child end up becoming a parent, for men, it's probably a little bit older, maybe 32, 33. Um, I see shock in the faces of young people when they see this. I mean, literally, jaw-dropping shock. Mm. And the hope I have, the optimism I have, comes from realizing that you know, these young people are going to do something different than the course they were on. And I think that means figuring out a way to have children at a younger age. Mm. And that might mean changing you know, what you describe as materialistic behavior. It may mean, you know, different career options. But young people actually have a huge benefit or a huge asset because the number of young people is shrinking. There's more and more power in the hands of younger people to choose careers and to choose employers that are perhaps gonna make it easier for them to have both a career and have family. And I, th I think, you know, therefore societies, I don't think policy is going to do much for us. Um, I think policies can be important. It may well be a very good thing to, uh, you know, build more kindergartens, uh, daycare to, you know, in, in some way um, make being a parent easier. Uh, it may very well be, but uh, those things alone in isolation will not change birth rates to any significant long-term extent and certainly not back to replacement level. What I do think will change things is an awareness among younger people and society that we need to figure out something differently to make it easier um, for young people to, 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 do, to have children younger, yeah. That's, that's really interesting that you've hit on there that young people's bargaining power in the modern economy might work in our favor. Cause I was yes. talking to Mary Harrington and she was sitting in that seat there, good friend of mine now. And in her book, Feminism Against Progress, she pointed out how the industrial revolution ripped a lot of women's work away. And so housewifery became the norm. And then the feminist movement put them into work and set up a two income trap, which has since made it materially harder to have children. But the COVID pandemic, something that that has come out of lockdown, remote working, may actually be the ability for women in the knowledge economy to have remote part-time work while also balancing a, a child, um, raising one. So it's the equivalent of bouncing a baby on your lap while you're looming in the 1450s, whereas now you can put a laptop on your lap and also have a baby there. So that is, that is something that's, that's quite encouraging. To go on to the Cambridge thing then, because that's a, that's a hell of a story. You were invited by my, uh, my good friend Charlie to screen the film to students and students took prematurely quite unkindly to the film because they hadn't watched it they accused you of all sorts of isms and phobes which i thought was quite an interesting self-report to accuse you of transphobia um considering you're talking about the inability to have children and well lots of those procedures do unfortunately result in fertility problems they don't quite advertise in and then you weren't able to screen the film in the end because they decided that during exams, the noise of the protest may disrupt exams and that Charlie had to foot the bill for private security and manage a 90 person protest on a public street. Um, fortunately, you were able to have a, a very engaged Q&A with the students and you said that they stayed for quite a few hours after the original time. And I, I find it really crazy because most people have memory hold from this scenario. Two years ago, Cambridge University was giving fertility lectures to, to young women on the campus because they were trying to get ahead of this and they seem to have just dropped the ball on that. But I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you felt that students were, and, and people that have viewed the documentary, were, were more encouraged having seen it and participating in that Q&A because I do think there is a real problem about the deferring of the meaningfulness of family life for travel, for education, um, indefinitely among my generation. And I do know some people, 
some young women that have both watched your film or have listened to Miriam Cates recently who have said, no, you know what, it's accelerated my timeline. It's, I certainly feel it's accelerated mine quite a bit. One of the things that really accelerated it was looking at your coverage of Japan and Detroit, because you're not overestimating when you say this could be the, the collapse of civilization. I know you were looking at the motor industry, which is probably why you modeled it on Detroit. Do you mm. want to talk about what you saw? Well, yes, my business is based in the suburbs of Detroit. It's a city I've got to to know well. Um, uh, the, the people of Michigan, Michiganders, as they're called, are you know, I, 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 amongst my most favorite people. Um, I spent several wonderful years there. My 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 kids would vacation there. It's a beautiful place, but Detroit as a city, as a has a problem. Um, so going back, I think 30 to 40 years ago, the population of Detroit was around 3 million people. It was one of the wealthiest mm. cities in the US. Um, for reasons nothing to do with birth rates, the population of the city fell by 63%, um, you know, to, to less than a million. And that was because of the auto plants moving outside the city to other states, the jobs disappeared. There were certain dynamics with the city that, um, you know, were, there, were, there were riots mm. and people decided to live in other places, uh, suburbs particularly. But what you're left with is a central area of Detroit that to this day has far too much housing for the number of people who live there. And as you would drive through Detroit, which you don't do very often because, uh, at least when I was there, it's not the safest place to drive. Mm. Um, as are many Democrat cities these days, as we've seen. Well, I'll, I'll leave that to, to you. That might be the yes. case. But in terms of Detroit, the issue was um, exacerbated by, I mean, if you take a street mm. and suddenly one or two houses become vacant, maybe that's okay. You're hoping someone might move in one day because no one's taking care of the, you know, the the lawn, the yard, as it's mm. called. Then another one goes vacant, and another one. And then over a decade, half the houses are vacant. And then no one can sell their house because there aren't any buyers, so the value goes down. Mm. And then the taxes that the city are collecting to collect the garbage and fix the cracks in the street, well, the taxes can't do that anymore. And then the lights, and this was a real problem. Um, vast areas of Detroit had no lights at nighttime, which doesn't help with crime. Mm. And then vermin come in. And then perhaps you're the last family on that street. And I've driven down a street and I've seen a family having a picnic, young kids outside the house and they're the last house in the street. The other houses are often still there. They're just dilapidated, collapsing, uh, like after some world war. So you cannot shrink cities or towns or villages in any in a graceful way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you don't just contract. You have street after street that ideally you would say, well, everybody on street A moved to street B now, but that, you know, how do you do that? And mm. then, you know, suddenly street C and D, you know, are in the same position. You, you, you never, you, it's like a patchwork quilt. Now, um, Detroit did manage to stabilize itself. It went bankrupt in 2013, the mm. biggest uh, you know, bankruptcy in the US for, for, for any city at the time, at least. Um, it couldn't pay its debts. It couldn't pay for the pension funds for, for its workers. That's the consequence of not having enough taxes, not enough workers. It did stabilize the population levels though. It, people stopped fleeing the city. And then the reverse happened actually. We, you had really cool cheap housing and students moved in, artists move in, and the city center itself suddenly became a cool place. And the city finally got to a point where there were so few inhabited houses in various areas around the center that they're returning them to you know, uh, grassland or, or, or water lakes, etc. So there's a plan there. The problem for countries, so that's a template. That's what we got to look at. Mm. You know, that, that's what happens when you have too few people for the, the, the size of the city or the country uh, that you, you inhabit. And in, in the case of Detroit, it was able to stabilize its population because people stopped leaving. Different problem. Falling birth rates. We're nowhere close to stabilizing birth rates. Mm -hmm. So let's I mean, take Italy again. You have 900,000 people, age 50. You have 400,000 people, or newborns rather. I mean, that gap is frightening. Mm. So Italy is going to be in the exact same position as Detroit. And so is Spain and Portugal and much mm. of Europe. Germany too, by the way. Germany's not that far behind. Mm. And just for the UK, by the way, we're not quite as bad. We have more time to look at this problem and say, wait a minute, we don't want that. 
There are 900,000 people aged 50 in the UK. There are only 700,000 newborns. Mm. So we have a 22% birth gap, as I call it. Mm. The documentary is called Birth Gap. That's yep. what birth gap means. It's the gap between older people and the younger people who have to ultimately go into the workforce to, to support them. So 22, 23% is not great. France is similar, but every other country in Europe, you're looking at a much more dire position. So I, my hope for the UK would be that it you know starts to look at what's happening in much of the rest of Europe, in Japan and South Korea and say, wait a minute, perhaps we need to be doing something now before this gets out of hand. We, we only passed that threshold in, in 2020. That was the first year where there were more pensioners than the newborns. So it's dire, but there is still a little bit of time. I, one of the scary things, when you think of Potemkin villages in the Soviet Union or, or North Korea, or those giant tower blocks that are built and then pulled down by the Chinese state because there's not enough people to inhabit them, but they, they still want to register economic activity mm -hmm. on their balance reports, you, you think that's that's laughable. But you use the example of Detroit that we're going to have mass uninhabited housing um, eventually because... I think the stat you use, but 2050, there's going to be 800 million new people who succumb to unplanned childlessness. That's horrendous. And and I know you, I believe you're living in Japan now. Yes. You? Yeah. Uh, one of the most harrowing examples you used was the elderly people in Japan who are, who are utterly sad. I've heard uh, harrowing examples where some Japanese pensioners will commit minor crimes to go to prison in order to have some sort of human connection and better health care. Uh, you were talking about rates of Japanese pensioner suicide at one point in the documentary. Yeah. Um, that's unimaginable. I mean... Well, you know, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a side that we don't see because, you know, w what we have now, and I also filmed something very similar in Germany, mm. um, are older people without families particularly women because their partner most likely dies younger, yeah. who are living alone and rarely leaving their homes. Um, uh, so we, I really worry about this you know, humanitarian crisis of elderly people and loneliness. I mean, mm. the mental health issues around this. So the place in um, Japan, it's actually a suburb of Tokyo called Takashima Daira. So it's in Tokyo. And 50 years ago, these 10,000 apartments were built there, 10,000 for the booming economy. And my Japanese language teacher, she's very patient, I'm so bad at Japanese, but she told me one day that she uh, was brought up in one of these, you know, the, these apartments. And I couldn't believe because I'd read about this particular huge co complex and I asked her if she had been back and in 30 years, she'd never been back. Her family moved away, I think when she was 12 years old. Her friends moved away and I said, okay, let's go. And uh, you see that in the documentary and that's real. It was for the first time you see her joy at going mm. back. I think almost she was skipping at one moment, you know, remembering her childhood playground. And then she turns around and it's like, where are all the stores? Where are the shops? What's happened here? And the realization that this is a ghost town now. Mm. And yet what we found out was occupancy of the 10,000 apartments is 98%. They're not vacant yet, but it's old people living there, mostly old women mm. living alone. And that's where you saw some very sad things in the documentary that, you know, I, I, I warn people just to, you know, you know, don't watch this documentary alone sometimes because there are moments and emotions that come out, you know, throughout it that, that are harrowing. Um, that, there was something recently that a news story we covered uh, a little bit facetiously because it was it's quite funny to frame it that way of there are tower blocks being built exclusively for older women women who have been claimed to be have had partner abuse or separated and it's female exclusive and obviously the, there was some controversy of them admitting trans participants but, but neither here nor there and at the time we sort of laughed and joked about it being a cat lady battery farm which is what I coined but then after watching your documentary I, I just realized that's whether de facto or de jour, whether it's built for that purpose or not, that's mm -hmm. actually going to become more commonplace. Yes. And when you look at the social care crisis of where we specifically in import lots of people over, lots of migrant workers, mainly women, again, and we pay them very little because 
it's the state-funded healthcare service and we waste lots of money. And there was a World Health Organization sur survey a little while ago that found out that there were, I think it was up to a third of all elderly care home patients had been abused at one point in time while they were there. You're thinking, okay, again, all the structures both are going against you having children, but as soon as you're old, you if you're not being cared for by family because you're not having one, you're likely not just going to die alone, but you're going to have a, a very lonely and, and possibly painful last few years. It, it's it's not trending well at the moment. It's it's really quite worrying. Yeah, and a you know, counter argument I get sometimes is that, well, we shouldn't be having children to look after us when we're old. I don't think I've heard anybody say, you know, oh, I, it's because I want someone. But it is a reality that without community, hmm. without relationships, you know, life is hard, especially when we're older. And, you know, studies bear that out, that relationships, I think, are one of the most uh, important things for longevity and happiness la later in life. Um, so certainly, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone looks at kids as future carers, although that may turn out to be the case. But what I do worry about, you know, for example, what I saw in Germany was how people were treated in care homes if they had no family. Um, you know, there's a scene in a crematorium where the funeral director won't talk to me in the end because he he's been told not to tell the story. But what I know he had noticed was that the, you know, the, the bodies of the deceased, if they'd been in a care home without family, were malnutrition, malnourished, um, you know, and showing signs of markings where they'd been tied down in beds for extended periods. And he said that was only for the people without children. Yeah. And and we can see as well the, the rates of COVID death in nursing homes, for example. I mean, with, if you put lots of elderly, vulnerable people with rationed resources in one place, and then you have an illness which ravages through a certain population that's susceptible to it, I mean, you're of course, you're just going to create a death factory, essentially. Mm -hmm. the, the, and so making more of these structures, mm -hmm. not very healthy. Now, something that's come across this entire time in all of your interviews and your documentary, um, the fact that you're sitting across from me now, you seem like a really compassionate guy. Mm. Very temperate, very, like think so. very, very modest as well as people talk to you. And so the hysterical reaction that the Cambridge students have had to you is <laughs> very strange, but also... I know that there's going to be members of our audience, and we've we've spoken about how our global power structures are, are very averse to human freedom and very averse to human beings in many respects. You get that really misanthropic climate narrative being trotted out. I know there's going to be viewers typing away furious in the comments up until this point. Why aren't you talking about how this is top-down imposed rather than bottom-up? Mm. And you open with a, a quote from Paul Ehrlich, mm. notoriously, whose population bomb predictions have been utterly discredited, yet he's still given a platform. Mm. Um, he, he recently had a 60 Minutes interview, mm, for yeah. God's sake. Yes. And then we, we have people like Jane Goodall saying that it would be great if it was back to the population of 500 years ago. We've we've had Bill Gates talking about how hopefully with enough prosperity and medicines, we can get population growth down. So to what extent is this a uh, sort of top-down policy goal to, to reduce population growth? Do you believe that is the case? Well, I don't think it's top, top down. Uh, I don't think the world's coordinated enough to, you know, the Japanese and Italians mm. in 1973 to say, yep. okay, us first, yes. and, and et cetera, et cetera. And to be really clear on that point, this started in Japan and Italy and Germany and other places, and it never reversed itself in those countries. It simply spread slowly mm. across the developed world and the developing world. So it's a, it's a progression from that time over 50 years. So the idea could be coordinated at that level. What I will say about Paul Ehrlich though, there are people, uh, including Ehrlich today, who I describe in my mind as just anti-humanists. Mm. And they may believe they have good reason for being anti-humanist, maybe to save some creatures, to benefit the planet as they perceive it. But mostly they have methods to try and reduce population that are... Um, Unethical to say the least? Well, yes, I do think that absolutely maddeningly so, um, but also they're kind of surreptitious, they're not obvious. Mm. So let me just give you an example. Uh, in the US today, there's a population organization that has trained 50,000 teachers. Um, those 50,000 teachers use materials from the population organization and they teach 
I think it's three or four million. It's effectively every high school student in the US every year. Mm. The materials are used in human geography textbooks, but not just the US, it spills over to the UK too, and I'm sure many other countries. And it's very easy to, to, to spot um, you know, the kind of analysis or data from these population organizations because they always start with the year 1800 typically. And they draw a curve like this, you know, the population of the world was one billion and then two and then three and then it does this. Mm. And they kind of have this arrow going up and then they stop. They don't explain that we actually know based on the number of children in the world already having peaked 20 years ago, mm. that it's about to do this. Right and that we're gonna have this aging world and that then I'll, we are going to decline unless something changes radically. They always stop there with the arrow going up. And that's unusual because if, you, if I was explaining something to you and left out a key part about what's happening next, you'd wonder why I was doing that. Now, this population organization, well, who are they? Well, they're the organization founded by Paul Ehrlich in 1968. They were mm -hmm. called ZPG then. Um, they've changed their name since then, but they're the same organization. Z ZPG was uh, zero population growth, correct? That's, that's right. Yeah. And at that time, you know, um, you know, okay, there were a lot of people, it wasn't just Paul Ehrlich, who were worried about the number of people on the planet. Um, you know, pres included President Nixon, included the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller mm -hmm. family, etc. There was a lot of dialogue, what's happening here? Almost everybody else kind of said, oh, wait a minute, we know this is under control. For, mm. From the 70s, you could see already that the world's population was going to stabilize mm. several decades out. We, we've known this for a long time, but still some people in population organizations keep telling us there's another one UK based, their message is have one less child. And I've asked them, well, what does that mean? You know, if, if you only wanted one child, does that mean have no children? Mm. And you know, they didn't get a response to that. I think one of their members replied saying, oh, that's unethical, which it is. I mean, telling people mm. to have no children is unethical. So you know, there, there are people out there with voices and those voices get picked up in the media a lot. They get picked up in school textbooks a lot mm. and you know, in classrooms. So I think those forces have, what, what have they done? They've blinkered us mm. from looking at the reality of birth rates. We've just been looking at this oh, ever expanding population. Even for me, I have to say, um, I, I'm not an expert on, on environmentalism and wouldn't want to really talk about it, but my own position before I saw this data was it was almost hopeless that you know, consumption's out of control if people, you know, perhaps, you know, without having studied it, and Population's exploding, of course it is, because that's all I had heard all my days. So what, what's the point of saving the environment almost? It, it, there's no hope. But when I saw, wait a minute, birth rates are actually you know, going to stabilize. Mm. Population's gonna stabilize and eventually fall. Maybe this environmental thing, you know, we, we, we actually can do. So it hasn't helped their own cause, I think, to be blinding people with false data about ever exploding populations. So I, I, I feel what they have been doing and continue to do, uh, yeah, is unethical. If I, if I can maybe, because one of my backgrounds was in energy policy right before I came here. Mm. Um, and when you spoke about the, the Japanese oil situation, that immediately pricked my ears up because I was thinking, okay, we've strategically demolished our energy security over the last how many years where now the UK has record energy bills in Europe. And so that's going to have a, a major knock-on effect to people trying to start families if they think it's unaffordable. But one of the things that, that has always irritated me about the misanthropic side of the climate debate, the, the, the Greta Thunbergs, you know, the, 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 the George Monbiot's, the people that say that, that you can, that a child is too much carbon emissions. My thing is always, okay, what, what are we conserving the world for? More so who? Because it makes no sense to talk outside the human experience because we, we can't. A, a planet for its own existence doesn't have anyone to run to appreciate it. And also, I, I think, okay, so the, the IPCC's panel, even the most catastrophic of projections, doesn't say that the world's going to be a fireball in 10 years. It also says that there's maybe a 50-50 shot of if we reach net zero by 2050, of it really even doing anything. And even then, are we not cutting off our ability to give birth to great innovators, people that that are reared with an appreciation for the planet and nature and are afforded these material and prosperous benefits to become the, the scientists, the technicians that create new technology that allow us to adapt to climate challenges? By dropping our birth rates, we're potentially extinguishing plenty of new Einsteins and Newtons and so what's, that's just a really short-sighted plan to deal with coming catastrophes. 
I, you know, I come back, first of all, to say, you know, my position is it's up to every individual to decide how many children they want to have. Hmm. And, you know, I would say, please, pe- you know, to anyone listening, make your own decision. What, you know, hmm. don't listen to other voices. The, the point about the environmental impact of having a child, I, I do want to comment on that because, um, you know, I love data. I love data science hmm. and uh, I'm hoping one day I can visit a museum of data science. I'd like every city in the world to have a museum of data science. And within these museums, you'd have all these great visualizations that were used to explain complicated facts, maybe. Well, the, the maps you create in the documentary, uh, uh, we'll oh. show some during that. They were uh, amazing visualizations. And, and when the people looked at them in the documentary, they were shocked. So they were really powerful. So I agree, that'd be a good tool. Well, data visualizations are important. It's mm. part of what I've you know I've done in my you know my my career up to now is come up with ways to kind of explain data. But to the point, you know, this museum of uh, data science, there'll be a cellar. And it'll be the naughty room. It'll be the, the, the you know the room of kind of bad data science. And there's going to be a chart at the center of it. And it's a chart that's been published in a number of publications, including the Guardian. And it's hosted on many of these population organizations and it shows the emissions that each of us kind of are responsible for in a year from driving a car or taking a flight or using hot water for a shower, etc. And there's all these small circles, maybe the size of a grape, if you can imagine that. And then there's this huge grapefruit size circle. It's have one child. Well, I just look at that and go, okay, that doesn't make sense to me. How can that be so large compared Mm. to everything else per year, per Mm. year? So you go and find that that there is an academic paper which breaks this out, which links to another academic paper behind it. And what this original paper did was take the emissions for you in your entire life and then the emissions of your children well, half your children because you're going to have a partner mm. and then your grandchildren and then your great for, forever. Right. Okay. And put it all on top of your shoulders yeah. and then expressed it per year. So every year you're admitting today the emissions for every single one of, of your, you, you know, your, your descendants. And they're thinking the emissions are going to stay constant over this lifetime yes. without any yes. technological improvement. That's Correct. Mad. How did you know? That's the assumption that there's going to be no technological improvement whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and they're ignoring falling birth rates. They're, they're imagining yeah. that birth rates are going to be stable when we know they're not. So how this is science, how any academic journal can publish this, mm. how any credible, I mean, I, I, I frankly have to assume the Guardian didn't know, you know what they were publishing. Um, but again, it's this fear. So for me, you then ask again, why is someone frankly twisting the, the, the data so much? And to come back to Cambridge, yeah, it was a shock to me. It was just remarkable. It's, I mean, I've gone to universities before, international students have seen the documentary. We've had great debates. Um, I did one in uh, Qatar recently. I've done one in Japan. I've done screenings in multiple countries. Um, podcasts have had thousands of comments. Mm. And there's been nothing. You know, I've never been accused of the things that, you know, the isms or the, mm. you know, whatnots that, that uh, the Cambridge students who had not watched the full documentary decided to call me. So I guess I've touched the nerve of people who, who I don't know, you know, I, I, it's, it's unfortunate. I'd love to talk to them. I'd love to sit down. I am empathetic to, to everybody, but I can just assume that there's some people with a worldview that's being presented to them that, oh, there's too many people in the world. Mm. Therefore, this documentary is bad because, you know, we, it tells a different story. Or, or maybe it's telling some narrative that doesn't quite sit with their worldview and gender or other things. I don't know. But the documentary is simply, there's, there's no narrative other than me listening to voices from around the world and particularly from women around the world telling their stories or their aspirations. And the crew who joined me, um, there were nine people involved you know, throughout this, a core team of four of us and in total nine, I was the only man. Mm. It was young women who were attracted to this project to want to work on it. Mm. So I feel when the documentary got cancelled, the voices of the crew got cancelled and the voices of upwards of 150 women around the world got cancelled. And you know, that's just shocking. That's that's not right. So you've given your, your message to the people who would rather the information isn't out there and perhaps the ones that may have been taken in by the false narrative that human beings are a, a cancer on the planet and it isn't worth continuing your lineage and and man how defeating that must be to believe that what would your message be to to people like me 
who do want children, but see the the impediments in our way, maybe don't have the exact years planned out yet. What would you say the steps that we should take to, to get our life in order and, and ensure we can counteract this decline? I don't want to dismiss the challenges that people have today. Um, you know, I hear a lot, people probably rightly say that I don't consider enough the economic challenges for people today, perhaps like you who are trying to, you know, secure their life in terms of finances, a home, etc. But the reality is there's no right time. There's just simply no right time. And I, I think it's a case of asking, you know, how important it is to become a parent and being prepared to make compromises. There has to be compromises. You know, in some countries I go to, you know, you have some countries I go to, you have situations where young couples are, are living with parents. It's not ideal. It's far from ideal. Well, maybe the grandparents can help a little bit with child raising. Um, maybe that, not an aspiration, but... That, I was going to say that happened to my grandparents who got married um, at 18 and 19. They had to live with their parents for the first couple of years while they were securing a house. And then as soon as they moved out, they you know, had my mum. So. Yes, yes. I, I, so I think, you know, and I don't want to say that that's right for everybody, no. but it, it, it's very dangerous if you assume that you can first get your education and then first secure your career, you know, all these other things, first, 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 and then expect, expect so strong or hope to find the right person mm. and to be able to have a child. Um, I don't have the exact answers for you or anybody else, but I just think consider you know compromises being necessary somewhere along that pathway. But what I'd also say to employers actually and educational establishments, um, because there will be a shrinking number of younger people, um, it's in the interest of employers to work with younger people. Um, a term I like is vulnerability. There's a vulnerability to having a child. And the vulnerability, I think, is one of the reasons that we delay becoming a parent. Now, the vulnerability is particularly for, for women that you know, when you, okay, sure, there's maternity leave and you come back, but there's still a vulnerability. The vulnerability might be, will my career path be the same afterwards? Or maybe even will I have the same ambition? But the more employers can uh, take away the vulnerability, mm. and that may or may not be uh, you know, easy wishful thinking, but I think the more certainty we can give younger people that your career, your full career path is still going to be open and to provide some financial security around that, um, you know, maybe that's where policies actually need to be looking at rather than just giving people finances to have children, to provide a security blanket that you know, if if you end up being unemployed for longer or maternity leave just doesn't work out for any reason, you, you need a couple of more years. Maybe there is some policy that that can help a few people who are in that situation just to take the concerns away. Um, so I, I think on the societal level, and let me just also say for education, we're going to see shrinking number of students worldwide. Universities in Japan are already seeing it. Um, you know, the idea that you know, this growing burgeoning pool of younger people from around the world is always going to be there. It's not. It's going to be absolutely in the interest of colleges, universities, uh, any anyone involved in education or training to look at more lifelong learning. Um, that will give more opportunities to kind of have more uh, contact and more students over time. So I also think the idea of studying from 18 to 21, 22, and then that's it. Hmm. Yeah, really, I think that's quite backwards thinking, you know, doing all of our studies up front. Uh, I, I'm still a student. I go back uh, often to take college level classes. I'm doing one this summer on uh, book writing, you know, nonfiction book writing, to force me to finally finish the birth, birth gap book this summer. Um, so studying something that's relevant to you at a particular time in life, I think is much better than front loading an entire education. And um, so I'd encourage um, educational pathways, career pathways to be reconsidered. And frankly, the university or employer who does that will become more attractive for younger people mm -hmm. to kind of say, okay, I believe this company is going to be there for me as I make decisions um, relating to parenthood mm -hmm. uh, and onwards. 
Yeah, I think the flexibility will be in, in the interest of both the company and the civilization. And I think this comes back to a point that we raised earlier of technology can exacerbate the excesses of atomization and, and materialism. We saw that with, with being stuck at home and locked down and having nothing to do but get up midday, watch Netflix and, and feel lonely. But also, again, it can facilitate remote working. It can take a lot of the drudgery out of a lot of manual work. If there are fewer jobs necessary in HR firms or data processing or something like that with the rise of AI eventually, then we may be forced naturally to go back to a sole breadwinner economy. And that would free up a lot more time to actually raise your own kids. So well, I think we're a bit of a technological fulcrum and there might be a, a bit of an optimistic note on that. Um, speaking of optimistic notes, I know, so for anyone in the audience who who is convinced to go and watch it, you can watch the first 45, 50 minutes of the documentary. The remaining parts are awaiting release, pending how you plan to release them. Um, what's been the international reception for the for the documentary? Have other places other than Cambridge and, and our little outlet picked it up and run with it? Well, in Japan, it's been uh, yeah, it's been very pleasing. We're uh, become there's going to be a special program on prime time. Saturday night, equivalent to BBC One, dedicated to the documentary with a panel of experts that I'm going to be sitting on with somebody translating in my ear and dubbing my voice, I think, with a studio audience. And they're going to be you know, showing parts of the documentary. There's then going to be a cinema release across Japan, which is very exciting. So Japan is at a point where people know this is a big problem. You know, this is being talked about day in, day out on the media. And you know the the television company that's working with us. I mean the executives there. I mean, you know, well, one made a great comment. Why didn't we do this twenty years ago? Why didn't we take this seriously before we we got to this point? Mm. I think that's the opportunity the UK has. The UK is twenty twenty five years behind Japan, but it's going to catch up very quickly. This accelerates. So Japan, in terms of distribution, is good. Um, I'm in discussions on a couple of other countries with possible distribution options. Um, I, I um, will ultimately release all online, most likely by this summer, if I don't find partners to to promote it. I think it's a story that you know I, I made this out of passion, out of the desire that people can simply watch and understand what's happening to the planet. Yeah, well, when when it does finally release, our social media team will be will be sure to announce it to our audience. And I would definitely love when you do finally finish the book, the ability to uh, to discuss it on the show and and get our hands on a copy. I have to say, from a personal level as well, documentary is really rough to watch at some parts. But I think for my own good, you've probably shaved a couple of years off of off of my timeline. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. So I expect Stephen to rise up the list of preferred baby names in Oh, give it a give it a couple of years. Don't don't underestimate your reach. I mean, the the fact that this this week at, at the conference, Miriam Cates dropped your phrase and this is the first time that this topic's been discussed in mainstream political discourse in the UK it means that you're probably having a, a far larger reach than, than you anticipate. Mm. Thank you for Thank that. you. Thank you. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have had you come in. Um, for the audience, again, you can watch the first part of the documentary link down in the description and go to birthgap.org for the rest of the updates and the rest of your work. Thanks very much for watching and goodbye.